I felt like we were singing some old school songs today. Now, I know that that is relative, because some of you think that if John Wesley didn't write it, it ain't old school, or if the Gaithers didn't sing it, it ain't old school. But 1995 was old school for me, and uh, that was actually also the very first song I learned to play on the guitar, because it had three chords. And, uh, and really, for 90% of the song, you play one chord. And uh, so that was fun. So thanks for doing that. But it certainly expresses an incredible message that uh, really talks about what, what we've been, what we've started with the table. How God brings us, he has initiated this table talk with us. He has initiated this banquet for us. And he longs for us to initiate that with others as well. Well, tables have played a significant role. It may be simple, but they played a significant role in our life. Tables are, uh, are objects that we sit around to celebrate, to have parties at. Oftentimes, we're around tables because we're grieving. Sometimes, we're around tables because we're just caring for one another. Many of you started your first dating relationship around a table. You eventually met your spouse around a table. There have been treaties. There's been uh, a number of things that happen around the table. And although simple, they're a significant tool that God uses to bring people into community, to gather people. It's more than just symbolic, but God uses it as a point of hospitality. See, the, the uniqueness about a table is that it's inviting. There's no borders around a table. You can invite anybody to a table, and they may not initially have a seat, but at least they can be at the table, whereas walls divide. They keep people out. And we want to be a people that invite others around the table. And particularly in a day where loneliness is an epidemic. In fact, you may have uh, seen some of these articles, some of these uh, uh, newspaper clippings over the last a number of years, just about how loneliness has been shaping our culture. In fact, the Washington Post recently had an article that said the Surgeon General says there that loneliness is an epidemic. USA Today said young people report more loneliness than the elderly. Boston Globe said the biggest threat facing middle-aged men isn't smoking or obesity, it's loneliness. The Atlantic reported that loneliness begets more loneliness. The New York Times, uh, just in a, the last few weeks, had an article that said how social isolation kills more people than obesity. It's amazing. I mean, Americans are lonelier than ever, even though the opportunities to connect have exponentially increased. We have social media. We have relatively cheap phone plans. Well, truth of the matter, AT&T owns me. But for the most part, email is free. Travel, it's, it's, it's amazing where we can get to and go to in a short amount of time, and yet we continue to become lonelier. Perhaps it's our individualism that leads us to that place of independence, which ultimately takes us to a place of isolation. But a basic need that we have is connection. We all need to be around the table. You know, there are a number of studies that authenticate what we already know that Scripture has stated, but I thought I might share a couple of them just because you may be able to relate to them in a different way. Cigna recently did a 20,000-person study based on the UCLA loneliness scale. Now, the very fact that there's a loneliness scale ought to tell us something. That there's metrics associated with becoming lonely. But it revealed that those aged 18 to 22 identified with loneliness at a significantly higher rate than those 72 and older. The former Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy, was the first to call loneliness an epidemic. And through uh, the study that Murthy had, he said that loneliness causes an insidious type of stress. Went on to say that it leads to chronic inflammation, the increased 
risk of heart disease, arthritis, and diabetes. His research also indicated that loneliness has the same effect on mortality as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. I mean, you could argue, you could certainly argue that many of our other epidemics from pornography to heart disease can trace their root back, roots back to a lonely heart. Mother Teresa said that a life without other people is the worst disease any human being can experience. You know, the findings just repeatedly reinforce the conclusion that Scripture has already indicated. The conclusion that our brains are wired to connect with people. Our souls are wired to connect with people. These are design features that God has put in us, not design flaws. But God created us so that we would be connected to people, that we could sit around a table and enjoy one another. It also reminds us that our brains are social, that isolation adversely affects our entire life. In fact, the region of the brain that's activated when we experience rejection or loneliness is also the region of the brain that reacts when we step on a Lego. And if you're a parent, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But it hurts. The pain of loneliness compounds into physical sickness, and it's not cured with medication. It's cured with connection. It's cured with friendship. It's cured with the gospel. In other words, both the soft and hard sciences agree. We're relational beings designed to connect with one another, not merely individuals, but interdependent persons in community. So it's critical for us to understand that the vertical relationship that we have with God and the horizontal relationship that we have with people are symbiotic, they're interwoven. I mean, the reality is this, is that for us to rightly relate to people, and we have to rightly relate to the one true God. And, and for us to fully know ourselves as God has designed us and shaped us to know ourselves, then we have to relate to people. And one of the biblical expressions that we see in Scripture, that takes place through hospitality. I love what uh, Paul said to the church in Romans chapter 12 about hospitality. He said, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affections. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. And the last thing he says to sum it all up, and seek to show hospitality. Now, that word hospitality, I think a lot of times we take the Latin connotation of hospitality, but the Greek connotation of hospitality, which Jesus would have talked about, comes from two Greek words squished together. One of those words is phylos. It's where the word uh, philia comes from, which is brotherly love. The other word is xenos. And xenos really has a dual meaning. One is the word stranger. The other, if you even go uh, uh, further back historically, is the word enemy. So hospitality is showing brotherly love to strangers and potentially even enemies. One who loves their enemies, one who loves strangers in the same way that they love their brother. See, Jesus' idea of hospitality wasn't just to be amongst the saints, right? Just to be amongst the church. Although that's critical, that's important. That's what we call fellowship. And sometimes that happens without a meal. It's always better with a meal, right? But it's also to be done amongst those who we don't yet know. Well, last week, one of the challenges I had for you is to invite somebody that you don't know very well or that you're just getting to know, maybe a stranger, maybe even an enemy. Invite them into your home or into your space. That may be your office. That may be uh, taking them to lunch. 
And the second thing I encourage you to do is listen. In fact, try to listen maybe 90% of the time. You can just ask questions, let them do all the talking. And you can talk maybe 10% of the time. And then to write them a personal thank you note for spending time with you. Now, I hope that you've been thinking about who those folks are. Well, this morning I want to talk to you about, actually, I'm not going to talk to you about anything, but Scripture is going to talk about the value of hospitality. And there's some great pictures that Jesus gives us in Luke chapter 14. So if you have your Bibles, I want to turn to Luke chapter 14. We're going to read the first 14 verses. Now, in, in reality, there's four stories that Jesus uses to illustrate hospitality. We're going to look at three out of the four this morning. So Luke chapter 14, again, the next few weeks, we're going to continue to talk about the table. We're going to have some special uh, guys come and preach uh, a couple weeks after this series, and we're going to do a, a series in the book of Colossians and just go through the book of Colossians together. But this morning, again, we're in the table talking about the value of hospitality. Luke chapter 14, verse 1, one Sabbath... When he, talking about Jesus, went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. Now, the Pharisees and some religious leaders had invited Jesus to come over. They were showing him a version of table fellowship. Now, this really is a, a how not to do when you look at their actions, okay? So we're going to clue into what Jesus has to say. One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of the ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. That's creepy. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and the Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? So here they are watching him carefully. It's obvious that this is a setup. And Jesus is about to turn the tables on them. But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. Story number two, verse seven. Now he told a parable to those who were invited. When he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. All right, let's look at the third story, verses 12, 13, and 14. And he said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor and crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So let's just walk through those three stories really quick together. That first one, those first six verses, again, we see there's a setup happening. They invite Jesus in. These uh, lawyers and religious types are trying to catch Jesus uh, uh, doing something against the law. And sure enough, Jesus picks up on this. And and by the way, there's a guy who has a disease. He has dropsy. That's an excess of water in the tissue. Uh, uh, Today, uh, we would call that, um, well, edema. Thank you. Yes. And um, it was right here, and I just couldn't spit it out. Edema. And uh, now, and truth be told, they would never have had, these Pharisees, these religious leaders would never have had somebody on the Sabbath who had a disease amongst them because they were so self-righteous about being clean that they, they would not have associated themselves with. So it, clearly, this is a setup. Now, Jesus is pretty sharp, and he, he turns the tables on them. He heals this man. He knows what, the, what they're thinking and says, listen. Would you not have done the same thing 
if you had a personal matter like a child or a, a caught in a ditch or an economic matter like an ox, would you not have pulled them out? Would you not have saved them? Would you not have healed them? Nothing, right? And we need to make sure that our traditions don't trump God's mission. Look at that second story, this wedding feast where these certain guests are wanting to be noticed. And, and you know, the seats closest to the host were, were the best seats. And there are these guests that were looking for recognition. And so they were rushing in trying to secure these seats. And just a side note, listen, if, if, if where we sit makes us important, we're probably not all that, Right? If nothing else, we certainly have a misunderstanding of how God views value and worth. But this little section talks about humility, among others. You know, last week we talked about how true love redirects its ambition from ourself to other people. We talked about how one of the ways we express humility is by encouraging others. This passage is talking about how we serve others, how we lower ourselves rather than raise ourselves, but we lower ourselves to serve others, to give others what's best, what's better. And I love how Paul describes Jesus in Philippians chapter 2. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourself which is yours in Christ Jesus? Just to pause. I know we're not talking about that this morning, but I love that little short portion there that, that says, which is yours, talking about your mind, which is yours in Christ Jesus, because God transforms you. He empowers you. He gives you all the tools necessary to be hospitable, to serve, and to love well. He empowers us to do that. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. In this last section here, this great banquet around a table, we already sang about it this morning. Look at verse 12 again. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. So some of your Bibles may have a little bit different version, but here's what that literally says in verse 12. Do not always keep inviting your friends and relatives. Okay, so he is not saying don't get together with friends and relatives. He's just saying, quit doing it all the time. That expand your circle. I mean, his point to these these religious leaders who were exclusive in every way was that that if you want to share in what God is doing, you can't exclusively uh, uh, keep your invitation list to those who you already know and like, who are your friends and family, where you know that you're going to get a return from them. See, if all we ever do is spend time with those who will give us something in return, then we're going to miss out on an opportunity for God to bless others, for us to be a part of that. See, this passage reminds us that gospel service is to be without seeking a return. It's suggesting that we serve people who can't always give us a return on our investment. But it also has a lot to say about hospitality it has a lot to say about what it looks like to not only invite people to the table but to go to other people's table first thing i see here is that hospitality expresses inclusion hospitality express, expresses inclusion it's moving from me to we it, We all want to be a part of something. We want to be included. We want to be accepted. I mean, he's talking about some people here who would have been excluded. The the cripple, the sick, the blind, the lame. And Jesus is saying, they ought to be sitting around the table with you. Now listen, this was a different day, a different context, but the principle is the same. 
There are people that are walking around with incredible shame because of maybe a relationship that has been broken in their life and they don't know how to relate to other people in the same way they did when they were once married. Man, they ought to be at your table. Or, or, or maybe, maybe it is a disease. Hey, They feel guilty that they're experiencing that and they can't do maybe the same things that they once used to be able to do. I mean, they ought to be at your table. But just this basic desire for acceptance, this basic desire for inclusion is something we all have. You know, a couple months ago when uh, I was in Bosnia with with our team, we were attempting to do, you know, 300 miles on the bike in three days from one side of Bosnia to the other and uh, at one, well, not just one portion, multiple portions. My hips were just locking up. And uh, to the point, I could walk faster up hills than, than ride at points. So I'd just get off my bike and I would just, I'd just gently jog like this. But there was, uh, you know, a number of legs where I just, I just had to sit out, sit in the, um, in, in the van, and we would just go to the next stop. And uh, there was an instance where we got to this stop and... Um, uh, somebody was actually using the bike that I had been on because there was a blowout in a tire. So I was going to fix that tire. So I pulled the, the bike off the back of the car and I flipped the bike over. And um, I began looking at that tire going, I've seen this done many times and I need to go get my tools. And I remembered my tools were actually in the bike that had been riding. So I was kind of looking around for some tools. And a Bosnian man walks over to me and he just goes, got it. And what would have taken me 20 to 25 minutes to do, he does it in about three minutes without any tools. <laughs> and then he turns toward me, and he just hugs me. Now, at that moment, I knew I was no longer an outsider with that race, this memorial race that we were riding with people for people. I knew that I was part of that movement that was taking place there in Bosnia. He invited me into his circle, into his space. He initiated that with me. He included me. Listen, nobody wants to be that kid waiting to be picked on the soccer field, right? Nobody wants to be sitting at lunch alone. We desire acceptance, inclusion, now, some of you, when I say the word acceptance, you get, you're you already getting ruffled. I'm not talking about a, approval. But you need to understand Jesus was about acceptance. He accepted prostitutes and religious self-righteous types and, and, and uh, thieves and murderers. He didn't approve of their behavior, but he accepted them. He included them. He said, you too can come to the table. And, and praise God, that's true for all of us. See, hospitality ought to create a haven for people to be seen and heard and valued. And, 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 and here's a reality is that when people begin to feel heard and valued, when they begin to sense that haven, they begin to let their guard down. They begin to open up. I mean, think about it. Now, some of your relationships might be different if we were creating a, a haven of hospitality, moving from me to we. And, and let me just encourage you to use your home as a haven for people rather than a haven from people. That you'd see that God has given you a space that he would love for you to use. You, you know, I, I think so often we use our homes as as a place we want to, to get away from people. And in modern America, our, our home often is kind of that final line of defense against the world. And yet, it, and at the end of a hard day, we rush home, we, we get inside, we, we're happy to be in our castle, we, you know, we put the, the bridge up, press a button, the water goes into the moat, the piranhas surround it, <laughs> right? And we just exhale. God, oh, man, we're, we're away from the world. And yet, 
Jesus desires for us to use our home as a place for people, to be a haven for people. Remember, light is spread by opening doors, not closing them. And what would it be like if we were to re-grasp the power of hospitality, lowered our walls, reopened our doors and our windows and said, come on, come on in. Second thing we see from this, this passage here in verses 12 through 14 is hospitality defines relationships. Hospitality defines relationships. It enlarges our circle. I mean, one of the things that we see here with Jesus is by him saying, go out and invite those who you would normally invite, who don't normally come to your table. He's enlarging the circle, but he's also defining the relationship. You know, it's hard to be in a relationship with people if they perceive that there are significant differences. But hospitality can break down those walls. The very first time, this was probably 16 or 17 years ago, the very first time I ever went to Israel, one morning uh, we, we had been in uh, a city right outside of Tel Aviv called Petit, uh, uh, Petit And uh, we were driving to the West Bank because they had really great food. And uh, the West Bank is a Palestinian um, controlled area and you have to go through some checkpoints and things like that. And as we were at an outdoor market, we were invited in by some Palestinians. At the time, we didn't know that they were also Christians. But we decided to go into their home. There was uh, about half a dozen of us, and we're sitting around, sitting meaning laying around a table, and we're eating dates and having coffee, and uh, it was more sugar than coffee. Uh, (laughs) And we're trying to communicate. They spoke a little bit of English, and I spoke uh, uh, no uh, Hebrew. I can read some Hebrew. I didn't speak any Arabic, and there was even Palestinian dialects. So, you know, I was playing charades across the table. But what a beautiful picture for them to invite us. Had never seen us before. All they knew is that we were just buying fruit, and they invited us into their home. Their hospitality was extraordinary that day. In fact, halfway through our time there, we started hearing sirens, and we weren't sure what those sirens were, but those sirens were to signal that Israel was about to, within the next hour or so, about to send some rockets over to bomb portions of the West Bank, and those, those sirens reminded everybody to take cover get out, and these sweet Palestinians made sure that we made it to the last checkpoint to get out. Hospitality. But what happened in that home that day is there were some relational barriers broken down and it defined the relationship that we had with one another. That they valued me and we valued them. And it wasn't that I had invited them into their house, but it was that I was willing to go to theirs. You know, sometimes it's also helpful to ask a neighbor for help. Don't invite yourself over to their house, but... You know, Jesus understood that it is in this type of hospitality that we communicate that my life is not fundamentally or fully separated from yours. It means that not only should we invite people into the spaces we are in, but be willing to go into the spaces they are in as well. You may remember that story in Acts chapter 10 of Peter and Cornelius. Cornelius uh, hears from God, and God says, hey, uh, get some of your men. Uh, Cornelius was a, a, a significant Roman authority at the time, and he takes some of his men, and he goes, go get Peter and bring him back to the house. And so they bring Peter back to the house, and at this point, Peter had been struggling in, in so many different ways about uh, eating different foods, and, and should I even be in a Gentile's home, much less a Roman authority's home, you know, should, uh, w- w- would I be compromising my convictions by showing up there? And sure, there was questions too from Cornelius' perspective. You know, how, how could this powerful Roman authority welcome a Jewish man? 
into his home. But God led Peter through these tensions and into Cornelius' home. And within 24 hours, the gospel had been shared, and all of Cornelius' family became part of the family of God. See, the whole process was about Peter choosing to enter Cornelius' home. Going to his home was part, not whole, but it was part of the message that was critical for Cornelius to hear so that he could also clearly hear the gospel. See, hospitality defines relationships. It enlarges our circle. This is why true hospitality is not simply what we welcome others into, but it's entering the space and grace that's opened up to us by others. Last thing we see here, or at least the last thing I'll talk about, is hospitality is God-empowered and humanly initiated. Hospitality is God-empowered and humanly initiated. Our space is God's space. Our space is God's space. I mean, God's greatest show of hospitality was expressed in the form of him sending his son. We talked about this last week. That his greatest expression of hospitality is by him sending his son. And now he empowers us to initiate those relationships. In fact, TJ was reminding me this morning in Romans chapter 15, verse 7, where it's talking about welcoming people. That word welcome means to aggressively initiate. To aggressively initiate. Listen, people's primary need is to know Jesus, and we are designed to find family in the church. And hospitality is often the very beginning. It's the starting point of those relationships. So we recognize that our space is God's space. Now I know that this can intimidate some of you. It intimidates me to a degree. So let me, let me challenge you again to continue to open the door because that's the way light's emanated rather than shutting it. To truly express gospel hospitality, we have to let go of some of the entitlements and false securities that we have. This is tough. (laughs) Some of us are so embarrassed that our house isn't up to spec that we'll never invite anybody in. And I do think that we need to be thoughtful about environments but not obsessed with environments. But we often come up with reasons to justify our lack of hospitality. Could be we don't have enough time, we don't have enough money. Could be family commitments. Could be a fear of not feeling safe with loving a stranger. Could be that with all the hobbies we have, we just don't have the margin. Or maybe we're just worried about our home or our lifestyle being judged. Or maybe we're concerned that we can't control the children that would be in our home as well. But we got to let go of those refrigerator rules. I mean, you, you shouldn't just go walk in and take stuff out of a refrigerator. But we have to let go of some of those entitlements, some of those false securities if we want God to use us in the lives of other people. Hospitality also means that we're coming with an open hand. Two things before I close that I think would be important for us to just consider. One is how control plays a role in this. How how often we want to control our environments. Now, you and I both know if we sit back and really think about how much control we really don't have, then maybe we can loosen the grip a little bit. But is your desire to have control over your environments preventing you from connecting well with people who deeply need the fellowship and love of Jesus? Is control keeping you from opening up your your office, your home space, 
and others from sharing the gospel with those who long just for an initial connection. They just want to talk with somebody. Did you know? <laughs> I saw this on, I don't know, I saw it on something. And then I researched and, and I couldn't believe it was true. There are people paying other people like 200 bucks. I'm going to totally get in on this. $200 just to walk and have a conversation with them in the park for 30 minutes. That is easy money, baby. <laughs> you know what is so sad about that? That there are people who are willing to pay $200 for somebody to listen for 30 minutes and walk around the park. And we have something to offer that costs, oh, it does cost something, but the gift in and of itself is free. And the eternal benefit outweighs anything that they could invest in. And yet I wonder if for some of us we need to repent of the control that we so deeply hold on to. Second thing I would say is some of you may be concerned that if I just express all this hospitality and all this ministry that it's going to... um, I'm just going to have compassion fatigue. That there's going to be just too much. That it will create an emotional deficit in my life. And I will say that is something to consider. Because that absolutely can happen. And it will happen when your input of Jesus is less than your output of hospitality. So here's what needs to happen for us to be the most hospitable people we could possibly be. Is that our input of Jesus must be greater than our output of ministry. We often think about ministry a funnel this way. And yet we need Jesus to express himself to us this way. So that we can love others rightly. Pray with me. Father, you are so gracious to us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for how how unique and dynamic your word is to speak into our life today. Jesus, thank you for showing the ultimate as the, the ultimate hospitality. And Lord, would you help us choose to walk in that same type of hospitality that you expressed? Sacrificial, loving. And Father, I just ask that you would uh, put the names and the faces of people that you long for your church to connect with, that you would put those names and faces on our heart and our mind right now. In fact, that, that, that they would be on our mind and our heart until we act, recognizing that you empower hospitality, but you long for us to initiate it as you initiated it with us. In Jesus' name, amen.